Hello students, it's Dr. Sansom here for your pre-lab lecture for Experiment 7, which is the synthesis and analysis of ferrofluids. In lab this week, we have several goals for your learning. One is to actually prepare solutions by beginning with solid reagents. And this is different than what you've done in lab up to this time, where you've mostly been given prepared solutions that are already dissolved in water. So in this lab, you'll actually begin by creating the solutions that you'll combine together for the reaction. Because we're looking at ferrofluids, we want you to be able to talk about the electron arrangements and magnetic properties that result from certain types of electron arrangements within atoms. And we'll ask you to think about the multiple forces that are at work in our ferrofluid that cause it to have the properties that it does. We'll be using a variety of different reactants in the synthesis of the ferrofluid and so we want you to be able to explain the purpose of each reactant and each step in the synthesis and also write balanced equations for the process. And uh, the fun part of the lab is at the end when you get to play with your ferrofluid and observe how the nanoparticles can be manipulated to make changes at the macroscopic level. We'll also ask you in your report to look up a few of the uses of magnetism in modern technologies. And our process skill for today will be oral communication. And one of the reasons why we've chosen this process skill is because it asks you to use relevant and effective language when you're speaking about the ferrofluid. Ferrofluids tend to inspire wonder or awe. They're really fun. And so sometimes in all the fun, we can lose sight of the scientific principles. So one goal for today is to have fun, but another goal is to use relevant and effective language to describe what you're observing with your ferrofluid. And of course, listening to your lab partner, showing exchange by using eye contact, nodding, gesturing, etc and uh, responding to each other's ideas. So what is a ferrofluid? A ferrofluid is actually a colloidal suspension of nanoscale magnetic particles that exhibit magnetic properties. So this image is a picture of what a ferrofluid might look like. And you can see it has this characteristic spike formation. And so the spikes are forming because of the magnetic nature of the nanoparticles, and the nanoparticles remain suspended in the solution. They behave like a liquid, and they also behave like a magnetic material. What can they be used for? Well, NASA originally patented this idea to control the movement of liquids in space because there's no gravity to control the movement of liquids, uh, they could use magnetic fields to direct liquids throughout systems in space shuttles. And also, inks on U.S. currency are magnetic. This is one way to test for the authenticity of a dollar bill. So if you have a dollar bill at home and you also happen to have a very strong magnet, like a neodymium magnet, then you can actually pick up your dollar bill off of the table uh, using that magnet. So that's one that you should try. You can also find a lot of other uses, and we'll ask you to do this in your lab report, but we want you to make sure that you are uh, finding reputable sources of information. And so uh, one recommendation is that you narrow your search to government or uh, university websites. So you can use the site command just within the Google search bar. You can type site colon, and then whatever website you want to have. So for example, site colon dot gov, no spaces in there, will limit your search results to just government websites or site colon dot edu will limit them to just university websites. And if you wanted to be more specific, you could say site colon nasa dot gov and get just information from NASA. Of course, you're not allowed to use the examples that I've currently given you as the examples for your lab report. So you have to find additional ones beyond these. So what are these particles actually made of? Our ferrofluid is made of magnetite, which is Fe3O4. And Fe3O4 is a one-to-one -one mixture of FeO and Fe2O3. 
or iron two oxide and iron three oxide. But they're combined in the same crystal lattice, so that's why we'll write Fe3O4. Each iron ion is going to have unpaired electrons, which means that it can exhibit magnetic properties. We call that paramagnetism. The crystal that's formed is very magnetic, and that means it has a permanent magnetic moment, even though the electrons are arranged anti-parallel to each other. So we've got the electron orbital diagrams for iron two ions and iron three ions here at the bottom. And you can see that they both have unpaired electrons. And in the crystal of magnetite, if the iron two plus ions had all of their electrons pointing up, then the iron three plus ions would have all of their electrons pointing down. So they're arranged anti-parallel to each other. But because they have an uneven number of unpaired electrons, even when they're anti-parallel to each other, there would be a net one unpaired electron in one direction. So now, if you have magnetic particles, they are attracted to each other. So how is it that we keep the particles suspended in the fluid? The first thing is the particles have to be very small. And the second thing is that we coat the surface with a surfactant. And this is our tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide. In this diagram, you can see the hydroxide ions sticking to the surface of the magnetite, and then the tetramethyl ammonium ions surrounding the outside. This gives each particle a coating of positive charge. So that means there's electrostatic repulsion between the particles, and this has to be stronger than the magnetic attraction between the particles in order for those particles to stay suspended and not stick to each other and precipitate out of the solution. If the particles become too big, then the magnetic attraction becomes too strong and they precipitate out. And this is one of the reasons in the procedure why you want to make sure that you're adding your ammonia slowly so that you don't make the reaction happen so quickly that large particles form. So what happens when you are applying a magnetic field to a ferrofluid? You'll see these spikes form along the magnetic field lines. And this is due to a balance of forces. Gravity, of course, is pulling down. Surface tension is helping the surface stick together. And then the magnetic field is making those magnetic particles align along the magnetic field. So in this instance, our magnetic field is pointing out. So we have the spikes that are pointing out, but you can see this smooth connection between them. That's because of the surface tension. And of course, gravity limits how high those spikes can be. One thing you can try with your ferrofluid is to actually turn it upside down and see how it works if gravity is helping form the spikes instead of limiting their height. For this experiment, there's several important safety things that you should be aware of. Of course, you want to wear the appropriate PPE, including gloves, for this experiment. Uh, the tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide that you're using today is one of very few chemicals that we use throughout this semester that gets this skull and crossbones uh, symbol for it, which means that it can be fatal if it's swallowed or in contact with skin. You use a very small amount of tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide and it's not fully concentrated when you use it. So the, with the quantities that you're using, you should not be in danger, but you should use extra caution when using that chemical and make sure that you wash your hands thoroughly after you finish the experiment. The acid solutions that you're using are corrosive and they can cause burns to your skin or eyes, and they're also acutely toxic by ingestion, so again, avoid eating and drinking in the lab and make sure you wash your hands. The ammonia is mildly corrosive, but more importantly in this lab, it does have some fumes, so you'll want to make sure that as you're adding the ammonia, that you're doing that underneath the downdraft on your lab bench. The ferrofluid that you're making will also stain pretty much everything. So you want to avoid getting it on fabrics or uh, your skin or anything else that you don't want to turn black. Okay, the upcoming exam two will be open after you finish experiment eight. So not this week, but next week. 
You should look for review announcements on Learning Suite and by email. And there is an exam to content page on Learning Suite that has a study guide and more information about the test. That's everything for this week. I hope you enjoy the lab and have a great day.